Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. And what are we talking about today, Tara? We are talking about part one of the last book of the Throne of Glass series, which is Kingdom of Ash. And we are almost done. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. It's went by really fast, a lot faster than I thought it was going to. I legit was a little bit worried about reading all of these books in the time frame we'd given ourselves. We had over three months, but it still feels like it was a really quick three months. Yeah. And you're about to go to Europe and I'm crazy with work stuff and it's been it's been quite the journey. Yes. A lot of reading, but it was made better by how quick these books are. There's a lot in each book that happens. So that makes it a lot easier to read the like 600 pages we had to read for this part. Yeah, I was going to say, speaking of, speaking of how much happens in the book, this one had an insane amount. It reminded me of like Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones when all of the battles are breaking out and there's just so many high stakes that are playing out. So previously we recorded Tower of Dawn. So if you have not checked out our previous episodes, definitely go back and do those. We just give in-depth spoilery discussions of all of that. And the previous book left to us with Kaol and Irene sailing as husband and wife to the northern continent of Aurelia to rejoin with our crew. And then Empire of Storms ended with, you know, Rowan being distraught essentially because Aelin has been captured by Maeve she is masked and in an iron coffin and we're going to see how she's been doing so part one of Kingdom of Ash by Sarah J Mass is armies and allies and it is basically that like the whole first 585 pages of this so there's a couple different prologues from Aelin's perspective and Rowan's perspective well, I could touch on the one about Aelin because I remember that part, but the Rowan one you might have to, to kick up into. Um, so Aelin, we get to see a little bit of that torture that has been inflicted on her, which guys, Aelin is kind of used to torture, which is sad for her, but this is the worst that I think she's ever had. And what's his name? Karen, kind of? Karn? Karen. Karen is... Much like Grave, but I think worse because he's also Fey, and he also has the backing of Maeve. And so he is just going to town. And it's to the point that Aelin is losing all of her scars that she previously had because she is being healed so fast. Her skin is just being like created anew. And so that is the level of torture our poor Aelin is going through right now. And Maeve wants her to tell her where the stones are. The word keys, not the stones. The word, yeah, the word keys. They're kind of stones, though. I mean, Mm -hmm. really. And so that is why she is having Karen inflict all of this on Aelin. Because Aelin won't tell her. Aelin is going physically through it, psychologically through it, as we'll talk about a little bit later when we speak more to Maeve and what she's up to. And then the Rowan prologue is essentially him just being really sad that he can't sense his mate anywhere. He knows that she's alive. Like, he can feel that much, but he has no idea where in the world that she is. And so his task has become with Lorcan and a lead in them to figure out where she is and to go rescue her. So it has been over two months since Maeve hauled her off on the ship and disappeared. And there are a couple little reunions that are nice and sweet, given everything shitty that's happening, like Adian and Lysandra, or no, Evangeline. So there's like a little reunion with Evangeline, which is sweet, and she's just kind of this rambunctious little girl who's able to be a kid again, you know, how Mm -hmm. she's been with Ren. So that's really sweet to see. But there's not really a lot of sweet moments happening. There are people mad at each other, i.e. Adian and Lysandra and Lorcan and Alid for good reason. One of the other little sweet things, and I mean, it's kind of grasping for straws, but I still thought it was pretty sweet, is Fenris and Aelin. So Fenris has um, kind of also been punished because 
as we find out, he is like the one that Maeve wants, I think. Like, and wants is in sexually. And he he doesn't he doesn't feel the same, but his twin, Connell, does. And so Maeve has been using Connell to like get Fenris in line a little bit. And as punishment for Fenris kind of siding with Aelin at the battle and Gavrielle siding with Aelin and Rowan siding with Aelin, all of those, she has punished Fenris and made him watch Aelin suffer this whole two months. And he does it in his wolf form because he's not allowed to switch back to his um, fey form. And so he has to sit there and watch Aelin suffer. And he also suffers because there's one kind of scene where they won't let him go to the bathroom. And so he just has to hold it the whole day, which, I mean, I can't stand not being able to pee. Like, like if I have to go, like I'm running, you know? And so that's sad. But then Aelin and Fenris kind of devise this little plan of how to talk. And they have the like, blink once if you're okay kind of thing. And I'm here for you. Like we're in this together kind of things. And while that's, really really sad that they had to do that with each other it is also very sweet that there's at least one one other person bonding through trauma yes (laughs) yes Fenris and Connell were diminished to being treated like animals basically Mm -hmm. they're twins right yeah and again this is kind of like Connell it's his choice much like we said in a previous book, Connell is the one who chose to side with Maeve and Fenris went along with it because he wanted his brother safe, right? And so you see the one that like is making the decisions and even though they're dumb, dumb decisions, and then Fenris wants to make sure that his brother's safe. So he goes along with it and it it goes horribly wrong here because Maeve couldn't care less about Connell, couldn't. And at one point, she makes him kill himself in front of Fenris to punish Fenris, again, for his choice and staying on Aelin's side, even though she is, like, inflicting this severe amount of mental anguish on both of them because of it. Yeah, we can go ahead and talk about that scene because, I mean, as far as Aelin's storyline goes, hers is just torture every single day with being healed over and over again, as Tara said, her skin knitting itself anew and just being a clean slate, essentially. All of her scars that she ever got from the past are gone. All of her tattoos are gone. She has lost that part of herself and she feels upset about it, like anyone would feel upset about it, because it's this record of everything that she's been through and survived. And there is a scene where Maeve is trying to get into her head psychologically. So she's kind of implanting these different versions of the future, like her life, what it could be with Rowan. And she's talking about um, like fairy tale stories too, where it's really Maeve herself that she's talking about in these stories with like this princess or queen who was running away from these kings and trying to find a better world to live in, da, da, da. And trying to break into Aelin's mind to get her to swear a blood oath to her, to tell her the location of the keys, literally just doing anything. And there's the glass scene where she puts Mab's crown on Aelin's head, has her kneel in the shattered glass. And it was such a horrible scene to read. I can't stand blood anyway, but just crawling in glass. And this is the scene with Connell too. You want to talk about Mm -hmm. it? So there are a couple things that I'm going to mention and some of them happen a little bit earlier, but we do find out that Aelin is being kept in Dornell, which is Maeve's like main location. During that scene where she's kneeling on the glass, her knees and everything are getting so cut up and Fenris is there sorry Sandra's face needs to be kept in there um but um Fenris is like I'm here I'm here with you and Karen is behind her like pushing her down further and further onto this glass and Aelin being the feisty little bitch that she is 
throws a piece of the glass at Maeve and cuts her. And in that split second, she notices that her blood was not red. It was black. And she thinks in her head, okay, it's just because I've been suffering. It's just because like it's in my mind. She's making this happen, blah, blah, blah. But that is a little bit of foreshadowing for the future for dear sweet Aelin. And that is, again, the scene where Maeve decides to torture Fenris too and have Connell kill himself because Fenris is not doing what Maeve wanted him to do, which is just so sad because it's also like Aelin knows what that's going to do to Fenris and he's still choosing Aelin, which is so sweet. It was a super fucked up scene too because right before Maeve has Connell stab himself in the heart with a knife, she has him tell Fenris that he is a disgrace. And it's just, oof. Because Fenris already, you know, is insecure about things and feels shameful about decisions that he's made. Well, and she also, like, Connell is accusing Fenris of trying to take what's his and, like, just being a downright asshole to him when all Fenris has done is try to keep him safe. Mm -hmm. And he's just being an asshole. And back to the... Aelin's skin is getting like renewed every night to basically one of the scars she loses is the scar on her palm which is her blood oath to Nehemia that she would keep her country safe and so I think that's the one that hits her the hardest because that's the one she gave herself as like a memory and she also lost the scar of her becoming Karenon with Rowan and kind of And so she's lost the two connections that meant the most to her in the world in one fell swoop when she notices that. So that's also kind of part of that mind fuckery that Maeve is playing on her. And this is the one and only time I have ever been, okay, I can see Maeve's point. One and only time in all of these books. So when Maeve is telling her story of the queen that like chose her husband and whatever, she said that she, the the queen chose her husband because he had a library, like he had the <laughs> biggest library. And I'm like, mm, okay, that sounds like a pretty good reason to be choosing your husband. Like he has the biggest library. And Maeve, as that queen, was really just wanting to soak up knowledge. And so again, I'm like, okay, if you take out all of her evilness, I can see her wanting to soak up the knowledge and to learn more about different worlds and to try and find a world that's better for her because she's not fitting into the world that she is in. But then you add in the fact that she is going about this an evil way and you lose all respect for that decision. But again, biggest library won. That was a great quote. You kind of sympathize with Maeve a little bit just because she describes her home world as being cold and dark and she wanted somewhere with, you know, blue oceans and greenery and color. And so you that resonates with people. But as Tara said, the, the whole morally gray thing is, oh, she does it at whatever means possible. So Maeve is also claiming that she wants to protect this world and hence getting the keys and everything from the other Volk kings but yeah and i think she could want to protect this world from the other kings or the kings like all three of them and so maybe she is being truthful there but she doesn't want to protect it from herself she wants to do whatever the fuck she wants to do with the world so like she may be telling the truth that like she doesn't want the kings to get involved because then they'll turn it to the world that she came from and a like dark yeah world but she doesn't she wants everything to line up how she wants it to like she doesn't want to turn it to the dark world but she wants it to be hers so there is like a sense of protecting but also she doesn't really give a crap about the people she just wants the like landscape of the world yeah you got me thinking it's like does she want the keys just because she knows this world is fucked if they know that she is here because she's in She's basically using the entire planet as a shield, right? To protect herself from them and running, you know, world to world to world. So who knows if she really wants to protect it. She probably just wants to save her own hide and get out and go somewhere else and fuck over those people. Um, (laughs) But anyway, switching 
Yeah, um, so well, nice. Well, we have one more part that happens on Maeve's little world. And it involves like Rowan's crew because they do figure out where Maeve is keeping Aelin. And like we said, it is Darnell or Dornell. I can't speak. Anyway, Dornell. And um, so Rowan kind of sets Maeve up a little bit and he spreads, well, he has a lead spread that there is a Vogue creature in Dornell or like on like the outskirts of Dornell. And he does that so it gets back to Maeve that there's a caller running around, right? And so he wants her to go find this caller to where him, Gabrielle, and Lorcan can take her out, basically, is what they're wanting to do. And Maeve uses this as extra mind torture for Aelin because she says when she gets this, Aelin is the one going into the caller. And that's not necessarily what Rowan thought she would say about this. Um, but it it puts Aelin on a kind of, she's willing to die to stay out of that collar. And so she kind of doesn't give a shit anymore. And that is what leads her to making her grand escape. There were a couple super cool things about this whole sequence because... Rowan and crew find out where Aelin is because she is visited by the spirit of her mother and it kind of revs her up and makes her become more aware and very more resolved to say, take her own life if it comes to that. So she, even though she's in this iron coffin with this iron mask on, she is busting through the iron, almost breaks it open, But that force is enough that it sends this beacon of power out and Rowan is able to sense her again, which makes them pinpoint where she is. So that was like a really cool scene too, just showing the strength of Aelin because she is the heir of fire. And then I love a lead because she is so skilled at what she does. And there was like a little moment too where she's going around and spreading all of these rumors about the the collared Vogue prince that she runs into one of Lorcan's ex-lovers, which just makes her so fuzzy inside. <laughs> um, and this also leads to, if isn't it the same person as someone that Aelin had met before? Yes. Yes. Same so she one, met right? her Mistward. And SR. For some reason, I remember her also being one of Rowan's ex-lovers because I remember Aelin getting a little toasty about that, too. Huh. I'd have to go back and see. I don't remember. I could be wrong, but I remember Aelin getting toasty about this gorgeous lady who's there and being a little jealous. So maybe she just this, thought. This was probably when they didn't really know that they were yeah. mated and they were like extraterritorial when this one yes. came. It's probably something like that. Yeah. It, well, it was at Mistward. So they neither one mm-hmm. knew anything and Aelin was still feisty with him. And it was during that part where she was like, I don't know why I'm territorial over this dude. <laughs> and she's like, but she was getting a little feisty about it, but yes. And then also like, It was hilarious to me. And I know I sound like such a man basher. I'm not really, but I am going to bash on some men right now. So if you don't like that, turn away. Um, But a lead. So Rowan, a lead, Lorcan, Gavriel, right? They're all trying to find Aelin and they're trying to figure out which way to go next. And all the men are like, let's go here next because that one dude said this and it leads like, but this dude said this and this makes more sense. And all the men, well, Gabrielle aside, because Gabrielle was like, I'm kind of just Sweden or Switzerland or whatever the neutral place is. I forgot. But he's like, I'm neutral. Okay. And so Rowan and Lorcan are like, no, we're going here. And they go there and they end up wasting like two weeks or something because Alid was right as to where she was, but the dudes wouldn't listen to her. And like, listen to the lady dudes, listen to her because all you're going off of is this is faster. And she has a whole, like, this is why it would be here. She's so strategic like that. Like they don't give her enough credit for that, but she has had to rely on her mind and her wits to think strategically like that to get into the head of her enemies and anticipate. 
And it would, like, make sense that Lorcan and Rowan would think that way, too, because they were leaders of, like, armies. And you have to be kind of strategic in battle. But they weren't. And I'm like, dude, listen to a lead. You're going the wrong way. You're dumb. Anyway. <laughs> and so Tara's, I Tara's man rants are the best. <laughs> Which, can we talk about how Rowan came to some of this information as him just openly torturing people, too? Like, they don't yes. know yet that these these guys can be freed because the Volg are, like, parasites. So they're just like, whatever means necessary, I need to find my mate, I'm torturing whoever. So very cutthroat about it. So let's switch gears and hop over to Dorian and Manon and the Thirteen. So they flew off in Empire of Storms to go search for the lost Crocken witches that have been in hiding. And it brings them to the north. It's like an icy, cold kind of landscape. And Dorian is struggling a lot because he feels a lot of guilt with Aelin bearing the brunt of becoming the lock to be able to seal the gates as a sacrifice and so he's dealing with a lot of that. And he's also still trying to figure out his power because as we've seen as early as like the second book of the series, his power is very untamed. It's very diverse in what it can do. I mean, it can be fire. It can be ice. It's power. So they run into a Stygian spider or a Stygian spider finds them because it had been shifted into a white bear. And they figure out that this spider is the one that Aelin had met back in the Assassin's... Or was it the Assassin's Blade? No, she had met Falcon yes. in the Assassin's Blade. But this spider is the one that Manon tricked in Air of Fire and stole the spider silk from. But it is the same spider that Falcon made a deal with 20 years of his youth. So yes. all of this is coming to a head. And so the spider is basically like, let me live... I, I'm able to shapeshift because I took some of Falcon's power. Like it kind of imprinted on her when they made a deal. And she claims that she knows where the Kraken witches are. And so they keep her around, which she wasn't completely lying, right? She knew where some were and took them there. Yes, I think so. Um, but one, I'm going to back up to Dorian because I think also one of the reasons that he kind of mistrusts himself is him trying to grasp himself as king and himself as king after his dad did what his dad did. And he's like, do I deserve this? Am I better than my dad? And like all of that stuff is going on in his head of do I deserve to be where I am and can I make the world better i think is part yeah. of his like mental like figuring out himself right now and then mandan oddly enough i think is traveling a very similar like path in her mind of am i better than what my grandmother like forged me to be can i be better am i worth it all of those things so i think that that is one of the reasons that manon and dorian get along because they have a very similar mental kind of like journey that they're both traveling right now to be the best that they possibly can be and make themselves worth. We mentioned this in an earlier episode, but Dorian and Manon are like mirror images to each other because their paths have been so parallel with struggling with their family and who they are and being on the evil good spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of personal growth from Manon, yet she still does things like get the iron teeth, the yellow, uh, the yellow leg witches to appear there so that she can rescue the Kraken witches and gain their favor. So she's still, she's still like a little bit. She's chaotic neutral, <laughs> like at the yeah. moment. <laughs> but she still like does whatever is necessary to accomplish what she needs done. And it might involve, you know, some innocence getting hurt, but... She, that's like a risk that she is willing to take and be responsible for. So Dorian, he is a Dorian that ends up killing the uh, Cyrene. The witch? Is what the, or, witch or sorry, the, not the witch, the spider. The spider. Yes. Who turned herself he, into a woman. Mm -hmm. He strangles her. 
with his power. And was it, didn't one of the witches witness that? Because don't they call him on it later? Like, was on it Vesta? killing of the spider? I don't remember which one it was, but I think one of the witches did. And they're like, at first they didn't say anything, but then they like brought it up just like slightly like, mm, I saw you. It's probably Vesta. She's like the one kind of openly eyeing Dorian and thinks he's hot. And Manon can see it too, but they're witches, I guess. They just don't, it doesn't really bother them that way. Yeah, that was, um, I don't know, Dorian has a very dark streak now, ever since being inhabited by the Volg prince. Mm-hmm. Yes. For sure. There was that funny scene where Dorian shifted into a woman. Oh, yeah, as he was, like, trying to figure out his shifting. So Dorian does go on this path of trying to figure out do I have the capabilities of shifting? If the spider does, maybe I do. And so at first he was trying to just change his eye color. And then he was trying to change like his hair. And then he goes full on woman. And the reactions from like the other like witches in, in the surrounding, like most of them didn't notice it was Dorian, but then Manon's like, wait a minute, like, what are you doing and why? And so she pulls it out of him why he's doing it. And she is pissed off. So he is trying to figure out a way to conceal himself as himself so that he can enter more more wrath and steal the third word key. And so he needs to be able to shapeshift himself in there and shapeshift himself out before anybody notices that he is not supposed to be there. And so he is trying to figure out a way that he can disguise himself by using that and Manon I can't tell if she just doesn't want him to do it because she's worried about him or if she just doesn't want him to do it because she wants to be the boss but I think it's more the worried she just doesn't want to admit that yes she even though she has grown quite a bit she's still struggling to convey her her heart if you will which there was a really cool reunion with Dorian finding out that the last word key was in Morath. He goes to summon Gavin, but it's not Gavin that shows up. Who is it? Caltain. Well, Gavin does show up one time, though. One time. Doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Like the very first time, and then he goes to resummon him. And again, the witches, like, Vesta or like whoever sees this, he sees him like going off at night. And he does it every time while she's on duty because he knows that she's not going to, like, tell on him, which is really funny, too, because he realizes, like, she's got this crush on him and he's using it. But um, so, yeah, he's summoning people to try and figure out, like, what's going on and where he should be going. So, again, I bashed the men of Rowan and Lorcan, but Dorian is using his brain And it's being strategic and like, how do I get my end goal the best way possible? So I am back to being Team Dorian. If anybody's counting where I am (laughs) on my spectrum of who I hate and who I like, Dorian is now like up there. And we'll talk about why Adian got down a few pegs on my, he's going to need to re, I don't know. He's going to need to be better if he wants back in my good graces, because right now he's like, not. This conversation that Dorian had with Caltain was kind of cool and a little bit eerie because, I mean, she's a spirit, right? So she's a little bit ethereal, but she's very vague on what she can and cannot talk about. Like, she's very vague about who is there with her, right? Like, she will not say or cannot say. I mean, when have the ghosts not been vague? Yes. Like every single one of them is very, very vague. But there is a like scene where like somebody, I don't remember who, but they're talking about some of the gods are from this world and some are not. And so again, that's part of that vagueness, I think, because who's controlling the ghosts? Is it somebody from this world or is it somebody from a different world? Which, as we've seen, the ones that are wanting to get back to their own world are kind of mean. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it 
begs the question of who's in charge where Caltain is, because it's like a game of chess right now with everybody being moved everywhere. But I did like that he summoned Caltain because he felt bad about his treatment of Caltain because he thought she was just like this ditzy airhead and he didn't really like her. She and, kind of admitted that, didn't she? And like, she, she did. About, and she I like that because that was the like the very first episode, the very first book. I said, Caltain is bringing some of this on herself because she's making these choices. And Caltain even said that. She's like, I made those choices. Like, no, I didn't deserve what happened to me, but I did make some of the choices that led me there because I wanted you. I wanted the power of being with you. And so, yeah, Caltain, like, Adian's going down. Caltain just, like, went up even further because she admitted her wrongdoings. So, yes, I liked Caltain. Along with Dorian figuring out his route to Morath and trying to improve his shape-shifting power to be able to conceal himself while he goes on this solo mission... There is a scene with Manon and she, I mean, Tara kind of touched on this before, but she is begging him in the way that she does to stay. And she essentially proposes to him and is like, let, we could be allies. We could make this alliance through marriage. She's a queen. He is a king. I mean, it could work out. And instead of really answering her, they're just like, okay, we're going to have some sexy time. I'll let her think that that's a yes. And then she wakes up to a cold bed. And that was sad because, yeah, she, again, I think she's trying to protect him in, in the way she can and keep him safe. And so, but he's like, I don't need any protecting. Like, I'm on my own. I'm going to die anyway. It'll be fine. You know, and I think he was trying to save her because he had already, if Aelin doesn't escape, he's the one taking on the the lock. And he's like, why, why bring somebody else down with me if I know I'm going to die anyway? So, like, I think in his mind, he's like, this is the easiest way is to make her mad at me. And so, again, I don't think he did that necessarily to be a jerk, but... It was mm-hmm. kind of a jerk move. He also recognizes that he would be a ball and chain to Manon too, though, because yeah. he sees in her that she doesn't want to be tied down by, you know, her position or being married to him too. Well, and he even asks her that and she says, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. And he's like, I don't want to make you make a sacrifice. Like, Like, that's not good. Like, we can be friends, we can be allies, but, like, why do we need to get married if that's going to be a sacrifice for you? And we kind of skipped over the part where she becomes a queen because she is going to the the Cochrans, the Crockens. (laughs) I cannot say that (laughs) word. Um, The Crockens. And at first they're like, no, bitch, go away, right? Right. They don't want any part of her. She's been, like, hunting them down with her 13. And Killed like, her Sandra, sister. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like Sandra said, she she pretty much told the yellow legs where they were so that she could kill the le- yellow legs and, like, be good with them, right? And it didn't go exactly how she had planned because they're like, mm, that seems kind of odd that we've been here for, like, ever And nobody's found us. And now, after you found us, they did. Like, hmm. And so she ends up going to Petra and asking Petra to align with them so that she can, you know, provide more than just herself and her 13 to the Crockens. 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 Um, and, And Petra's like, I'll think on it. And then Manon's like, okay. They said that they would think on it and goes back to her little like house or whatever with the other witches. And then the three show up. So her grandmother, Petra's mother, and then the yellow legs, new person after she, Aelin killed the other one, (laughs) Um, Baba. So they show up. And the yellow legs has Rhiannon's crown on her head. And Manon's like, that's not yours, bitch. It's not yours. I love and Manon. <laughs> yes, yes, hilarious. Like, she she says it in a different way. And Manon is so feisty about this. 
And the yellow legs is like, well, come take it from me. And Manon proceeds to take it from her by chopping off her head and then putting the crown. Like, and, and then she allows Petra's mom to leave because Petra gave her the respect of hearing her out. And so Petra's mom's like, peace. I'm not with you anymore to Manon's grandmother. And Manon ends up kicking her grandmother's ass to the point that she retreats. She like hightails it out of there. She's running for her life. And I don't remember who says something, but somebody says something, maybe Manon. And somebody was like, no, you killed one of them. You allowed another one to leave. And then the third one ran for her life. Like you won, like you won. Like if you had wanted to, you could have killed all three of them and it would not have been hard. And so um, the Crockens end up crowning her their queen. Now we have a queen of the Iron Teeth and the Crocken Witches. And this is where it's the final straw, like the last ticket that she needs to do the, um, it's like a formal ritual, right? It's called the Flame of Yeah, it's basically the like, war. it's Brandon's fire that he had given yeah. to the Crocken Queen. And it's supposed to like burn and continue to burn because it's fueled by the fire magic, um, which is, again, another little tie in to Aelin being a part of their world because it was her whatever grandfather's magic that they deem as like a spiritual thing. With the Krakens being united with Manon, there are a couple positive things that come out of this too. Like she does meet her great grandmother, Glennis. And then she has a cousin named Bronwyn who is very cold toward her for good reason. You know, it's understandable. Like she's killed so many Crockens over the you know past century or two. And then we learn the name of her father. Yeah. And Bronwyn was also very, very close to Rhiannon, the witch yeah. that Manon killed that was her sister. So they were like sisters. And so she hates Manon because she killed her. So I think it it started out bad for Manon there. So it's in Manon's past, she was very siloed, you know, under her grandmother, Iron Teeth Matron. And now that she has gotten this crown and is uniting the two witch clans, she's seeing that she's not alone, like that she does have more family. So that's another comforting thing for her, like an area of growth. And she also saw the love that her parents had for each other a little bit more because she saw like her grandmother told her her mom's side of it and in like made it into a bad thing that they loved each other. But then her other great grandmother from her dad's side told her the love story as it really was and that they were willing to give up their like personal well-being for the well-being of the witches and so I think Manon is seeing the other side of the world and not just the bad side. So she's learning, getting there. And then she proposed to Dorian and was left. And then Dorian went and snuck into Morath. Yeah, that's pretty much where the part one leaves off for Dorian is he disappeared and we only assume that he made it there. Yep. And then we can fast track over to Kaol on the good ship headed for... You know, wherever he's going. Where is he going? Annie L. Annie L. So he's going to Annie L because Morath is going to attack Annie L. And so he wants to save his kingdom, if at all possible. And so he goes to Annie L and he has to fight with his dad because his dad's a little... A couple things happen. The dad finds out before Kale does that Irene is pregnant. Which, I mean, she was vomiting so much. How could Kale be so dumb? Okay, that was what I was going to say. Because, like, honestly, everybody figured out before Kale did. Because he's so dense. Like, he's just continuing his denseness. And I'm like, dude, at least he handles it well, though. But, yes, his dad tells him that, you know, she's pregnant. Basically, he's like, are you dumb? Like... She's pregnant. I just, I picture Kale as just this tall, handsome hunk that's not all that bright. <laughs> yes. <know>? Yes. 
but loyal, loyal to a fault. This kid to a fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Kale comes um, to some learnings and realizations too. While in Aniel, he learns that his mom doesn't hate him and didn't, you know, excommunicate him on purpose because Kale's dad was hiding every single letter that she wrote and breaking that communication. And then Kale also learns that his mom had a fallout. You know, the mom and his brother had a fallout with his father because he's such a short-sighted dick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it was one of those sweet moments, I think, when his dad is being a dick. Irene stands up for him and Irene's like, we wouldn't have an army to save your worthless little kingdom if it wasn't for him. So back the hell off. And he's in charge. Go sit your little old ass down. Um, those were my words. I was paraphrasing what Irene said. <laughs> but basically, like, she she laid into his dad. And Kale was like, mm, if I didn't love her before, I, I don't know that I wouldn't have fallen in love with her right there. Because nobody's ever stood up to his dad for him, I don't think. And then we have Morath attacking Annie L. And Annie L having a hard time because the people of Annie L were not warriors. They were not. So they're like holding off the siege with half of the Coggins army, Nazrin and Sartak's part, and the few like warrior like men that they have from Annie L. And it was not going well. And Kale couldn't help very much because Irene's over here trying to heal people. She's pregnant. He figures out that she's pregnant. She didn't want to tell him because she didn't want him to feel like he couldn't do things because it's not just her life he would then be impacting. It's the baby's life that's now connected with both of them. And so you see it not going so well for Annie L. None of the battles are going well. They're, no. The party is split. The main crew is split up right now. So Adian is off fighting their own battle that's going mm -hmm. horribly wrong. And then Aniel is also terrible. And they're still waiting on different people to show up. All of these favors that Aelin called in previously. We still haven't seen Rolf in the Fire Lances. We haven't seen... Uh, hussar and the foot cavalry like the horses mm -hmm. and so there's still a lot of people missing there's messengers that are dispersed out like Knox owens like he is kind of dispatched to get help and aid as well well before we introduce Knox, we've got to introduce him right because he's not dispatched when we meet him he was one of lord what's his name Darrow. Darrow. Lord Darrow's people. And so he was kind of running errands for Lord Darrow when we meet him. And he runs into Adian and crew. And he immediately figures out who Aelin is and that she is the Selena that saved his life during the trials. And he's like, nope, my alliance is to her. What do you want me to do? And so then he then becomes a a dispatched person to get aid. I love Knox because he also confesses that he, the whole time he was in the contest with Selena Sardothian back then for the King's assassin, that he was actually an undercover spy for the rebellion. And mm -hmm. it's just, we knew we loved Knox back. Way yeah. Back we knew when. he was a Didn't good know. guy. We called mm -hmm. it. So um, it's just all of that kind of coming full circle. And so that was a really cool reunion. And then we see in Aniel that the witch towers are being brought, right? That's in Aniel. As, as if things couldn't get any worse. Yeah. So Morath's forces are working on breaking down the dam at Aniel, uh -huh. but we haven't really discussed how Aelin gets there yet. Well, we haven't discussed what happens to Aelin. Yeah. So let's bounce back to Aelin because she does end up escaping and she does so because Fenris basically gives his life to break the oath and let her out. So he, as we discovered, it's very, very, very hard to break the oath. And so he is fighting because they're about to basically kill Aelin, like Karen is. Like he is, he is to that point. 
and Fenris knows it and Aelin is giving up. And so Fenris is like trying to break this oath and trying to like make himself human again. And he ends up doing it and he knows that it's going to kill him if he does it, but he does it anyway to save her. And so then Aelin leaves and starts running for Lorcan. And at this time, Rowan is trying to find Aelin in the city. He is like searching everywhere or well, they're like out on the battle, like intense right now. They're kicking ass. Yeah. Yeah. And so Rowan is trying to find Aelin and she ends up finding Lorcan instead. And Lorcan sent out his power to tell Rowan that she is here. And Aelin basically tells him to go back and get Fenris. And Rowan goes back and he finds Karen and he skins him alive. Which I bet there was a lot of blood to that too. So, but that blood I was happy for. Skins him alive, gets Fenris, and they then find out what happened to Fenris. And Aelin being Aelin figures out a solution for this problem that Fenris is going through. And she offers him the blood oath to her, thinking that if a blood oath is going to kill him, maybe a blood oath would save him. And so she offers it to him and he takes that blood oath and he is getting better. Her quick thinking does work out. That was such an emotional scene when she is running through trying to look for anyone, any friendly faces. She still has the mask on, right? Because Uh it's not just your normal lock. And she is desperate and screaming like get it off get it off get it off like repeating this over and over it was so sad yeah so she gets reunited with them they end up she she teaches rowan the word the word symbol or whatever to unlock things and that's how they're Mm -hmm. able to get the mask off of her and yes she can smell Karen's blood all over Rowan and that's how she knows (laughs) the extent of what Rowan did um, yes and so she is she's changed she's different than she was before she was tortured and Rowan and everybody notice this and Fenris is the only one that can get a reaction out of her and it is that blinking and so she had this conversation with Fenris through blinks and everybody else is kind of like what is going on and she like cuts herself and offers it to him and that's how like they go through that and that is also very very sad that she is not like other than saying take it off she is not talking she is not like Aelin she's not swaggering Mm -hmm into the room you know she is a changed person so that is hard to see our Aelin and the rest of the team doesn't even know if she's able to use her power because there's not an inkling of it she Mm -mm. refuses to use even a crumb of it and we see there's a reason mm -hmm. for that because she is saving up her power she has figured out how to go even further into her magic because she was in that iron box So she is like diving. Yeah, it's described as a well, right? It's how deep down in the this reserve that she can go is that she stores up this power. And she had intended on using it to smite Erewhon, but no, she was gonna become very dire. Or she was gonna smite Maeve. That was gonna be her killing blow to Maeve. Erewhon, they've got the lock. They're just gonna throw him out. But she was going to kill Maeve for what she did to her and to Rowan. She wasn't going to let her just go into a different world. But we do see some other people that come back in, the little folk. um, And it surprises, I think, Gabrielle and Lorcan, because they're like, why are they helping her? And then they bring her the crown of Mab. And then they're like, wait, she is Mab's descendant. So they figure out that she is the little folk's queen. And that's why they have been helping her her whole life, um, because she is their queen. And then you see her being kind of like a little matchmaker with Lorcan and Alid, because Lorcan's being his sulky little self, because Alid is still mad at him. And Alid is happy that they found Aelin, right? And so she's like beside herself, except for when Aelin offers the blood oath to Lorcan. Alid's kind of like, well, what the hell? Like... I'm a part of your your court already. Why don't I get the blood oath if you're just going to hand it out? And 
Aelin went over to her and she's like, I'm not going to give you this because you are a part of my court already. And if we are going to go to war, I need votes. And I can't have that like tainted by the fact that you are blood oath to me. And so then Aline's like, oh, okay. But Gabrielle's still sitting over here like, why not me? Like you offered it to like everybody else but me. And basically it's because she wants Adian to have that choice. Mm-hmm. of whether or not his dad gets to be a part of their court. And Adian is going to be a part of their court first. She's going to blood oath him before she allows Gabrielle to take it, if Adian decides it's okay. And so then Gabrielle's like, oh, okay, it's, if it's for my son, I'm good. Gabrielle's Which is so good sweet. Father. I love his mm-hmm. like father. Like Even though he just found out he was a father, he like has this strong bond to yeah. fatherhood. He's, Gabrielle is a good egg. You feel bad because Adian, all he's wanted all his life is to be blood sworn to Aelin and do his duty. And you see everybody else literally getting the blood oath before him. Aelin also threatens Lorcan, though, and is just like, if you don't take this, you're not allowed anywhere near, basically insinuating that he will never see Elite again if he does not oath himself. So, yes. Lorcan gets And so a little, he takes it because smart. he wants to protect Elite. Which Uh is a sweet moment for Lorcan, because Lorcan's kind of a, like, gruff dude. He's grumpy. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's sweet that he chose to do this, even though I have to assume he has some bad feelings about the blood oath. And we do find out a little bit more about him and what happened really on that beach, because he wasn't crawling towards Maeve. He was crawling towards Aelin to try and save her, because he realized what Maeve was doing. And so Elite is pissed off at him thinking that he was crawling towards Maeve and that he just loved her that much. But what he was actually doing was basically breaking the blood oath Mm -hmm. himself. And so you do get a little bit more of a nice picture of Lorcan as opposed to just like the dude who loves Maeve. It definitely helps. Speaking of scorned lovers, though, there's Lysandra and Adian. Because if you remember, Adian is pissed off and all haughty because Lysandra and Aelin went behind everybody's backs and made their own game plan with Lysandra posing as Aelin. And we see how this turns out because there are a couple battles that happen. There's like, we'll call it the Battle of Aniel, and then there's the Battle of Paran. Terrison. Yeah. Greater area. Because they, they yeah. go all over the place. Mm-hmm. So on one front with the with the Paranth area, you have Adian's Bane that's there and he's no longer the commander of. He's been demoted after some um he was it was Killian who was um Yeah. Killian who's part but of that's, the Bane. Yeah. That's after part of this battle. And yes. Daro tells him to leave and Adian wants to like fight as much as he can, and they end up getting their ass kicked. Yes, Morath's um, forces are sweeping through the continent. There's no sign of their allies coming in clutch to help. They're dragging these witch towers over. The Their own troops are losing faith in their own side because Aelin, Aelin has who is Lysandra, refuses to use her magic to help them in this war. People are dying left and right. It gets so bad that their own soldiers start fleeing and just abandoning the cause and so in a move of desperation Lysandra enters the field and just with a sword and starts fighting Balg and gets herself very wounded and poisoned and this makes Adian lose it there's a witch tower used that kills off like four or five thousand of their soldiers just turns them to ash just vaporizes them so that is the power of what's coming And things are very, very bad. Adian ends up fleeing um, with the army because they're getting their asses kicked. And then when they're fleeing, they're put into a position that's impossible because now they're surrounded on all sides. And it's not until Rolf shows up with the Mycenaeans and the Fire Lances to aid them to get onto the ships to run away that they're able to escape that horrible death trap. And... It was so sad because Ansel's with them 
And at one point, the enemy forces are launching what they first think is like arrows at them. And it turns out to be like heads of her own men. So Ansel is just like on her knees crying and beside herself because those are her people that are lost. And it's just, there was so much carnage in this part of the book. Like it was nonstop. There was just so much death and well, loss. Well, we didn't even talk about the Adian moment that just like made him, eh, in my opinion. <laughs> Tara, but anyway, Tara okay, rant so incoming. <laughs> it is. It's incoming, guys. Um, so Adian is mad at Lysandra for kind of like not tricking him, but kind of tricking him. And then also like making him a breed, like a stud um, <laughs> for royal children, which I get his point because like, you're going to make me like sleep with my cousin. And like you, like, how are you going to convince me to do that? Like, especially if like me and you were together and you know, you, like it's just a convoluted situation and I get his point on that, but he takes it a little too far. First he goes to ignoring Lysander and he's like, I'm not talking to you. Like I'm mad at you. And then she goes to talk to him and he throws her out of his like tent naked into the snow and is just like, you're useless and like, horrible things he is saying to Lysandra, especially because he like literally, I don't know, two months ago told her that he loved her and all of these things. And again, I can see his point on the betrayal, but do you really need to like say such hurtful things? Like she's doing the best she can to keep shit alive. And he's calling her useless because she doesn't actually have firepower. And I mean, it's just, it's just one of those. eh. It was a really low blow. He basically treated her like a whore. Just like, yeah, you know, go out there. There's also other soldiers and men out there and she's just in the cold naked. Yeah, I I was very disappointed with our boy. <laughs> yes, and I he was a little upset because he was like getting his ass kicked. So I understand that part too, but like it's still not okay to treat somebody like that. Yeah. And so Adian is getting his ass kicked and Terrison, Rolf arrives and helps him out a little bit. And so they do end up fleeing. And I think that's where we leave them off, is they fled a little bit. They're still alive. Rolf has them in their boat. Yeah, and then meanwhile, the the battle of Aniel is not going good because Aelin has met up with them. So she's there, but she's been reserving her power The enemy forces are working on breaking the dam. Lorcan gets out on the battlefield to try and do what he can. And then it's like Nezrin and Sartak who go on rooks and they're like scanning the field. They are the ones that discover the Morath's plan to break the dam. And they're like, holy shit. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we have to, you know, get people out of this. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, everything horrible is just happening. So everyone is on the, what are they called? The battlements. Mm -hmm. They're overlooking at all this shit happening. People fighting, all of this stuff. Aelin isn't out there using her power. And then they're like, where's Lorcan at? Elite is like, where's Lorcan? And they're like, well, he was out there on the field. And, but it's come to a point where they all logically know they cannot go out there because they will get killed by this blood that's about to run through everyone Mm -hmm. so elide freaks out hops on kale's horse this little hellion from the south um for for asha it's like yeah for asha the black horse which means butterfly Mm -hmm. which kale keeps pointing out that he loves like riding this horse out into the volg like armies and taking them out on a horse named butterfly like he's (laughs) like this is just a great like juxtaposition of uh-huh. like a fun floaty little butterfly killing you know but frosh is anything but a butterfly he also yes. nicknames her helius's horse and i want to say something about why lorkin got so hurt so right before that he and elite had a fight another one imagine that everyone's Elite fighting. is still spicy with him about everything 
And she basically just like lets him have it again and basically says, no, like, we're not going to be together. I don't like you. Like, leave me the hell alone. She's like, I don't care if you walk off the field alive. And so Lorcan, as he's out there fighting, he's like, well, I guess it doesn't matter. And he lets his shield down and he basically lets lets somebody hurt him. And Alid, as Sandra was alluding to, like everybody else is like, nobody go out there. And Alid's like, Ooh, I'm going. I got to find Lorkin, who I just let have it and told I didn't like and I couldn't care less about him. She so is she- losing her mind. This whole sequence yes. was so cinematic. You're just imagining all of these people fighting each other, bodies everywhere. It's talking about Farasha just like trampling over skulls and stuff like that. And you just like picture a lead on this dark horse racing across this killing field, crushing all these skeletons, corpses, looking for Lorcan. And she does find him buried beneath a pile of bodies. And it's this scene and she's like telling him and screaming at him to just suck it up basically, even though he is split open so bad that you can see his like spine or bones inside. It's just disgusting. Like he is on his way out, like dying and he sucks it up and gets on this horse. She's breaking her ankle. I'm like cringing the whole time I'm reading this because it sounds like the most painful experience for everyone. And the reason he sucks it up is she says, I'm not leaving. And he's like, yeah. well, I'm not going to let you die out here. And so yeah. he sucks. <laughs> poor and the guy is like. The poor horse, too, because Lorcan is this enormous man. And so now the horse is carrying Lorcan and Elid, but it's still like flying across this field. And he's still like, oh, we're never going to make it. So I'm going to try and fall off this horse. And Elid knows what he's doing. And she like grips him and like winds herself with him like if you go i'm falling off this fucking horse too and so then he's just like well shit i guess we're both dying because i i guess i'm out of ideas yeah he's just mm. well and you mentioned that aelin was not out there but she was out there she just was out there as the assassin and so aelin's out there taking them out with her like swords and stuff the gold armor Yes, the, which, which she stole from the cave that the little people took her to. I forgot to say that. So, like, they go and loot this cave, and Gabriel is, like, he's hilarious because he's like, should we be doing this? Like, is this right? <laughs> and everybody else is like, what are they going to do with it? Because it's this cave of, like, the former kings, and so they have all their treasure down there. And Aelin's like, they're not using it. I might as well use it. And she also steals wedding rings for her and Rowan. Because she's like, in my culture, we have wedding rings. <laughs> and so, but, and so they're like loading up all of this treasure and, and stuff into their little rowboat is what I think of it. Um, that the little people kind of gave them. And the little people are directing them out of the cave and to Danielle, mm-hmm. basically. And so they now have a lot of money as well <laughs> because they stole it all. Um, and so Aelin is out there and Aelin uses her magic out there, doesn't she? She does. This is like her Hail Mary when Mm -hmm. a lead is close enough, like a minute from the gate and the dam comes washing out and she, she vaporizes most of it, but she also makes like cracks into the ground where it seeps into it. So it becomes like nothing. Like, this is the greatest display of power that she has shown to anyone. And everyone is just awestruck. Because it's while Elite is making this mad dash to find Lorcan, and everyone is, like, so vested in what's going to happen. Aelin disappears. Like, she books it out of there. And then Rowan's like, what the hell? Where did Aelin go? And then they see her out there in her gold, blood-soaked armor. Um, Which they that. stole from... Kale's dad too, which was a hilarious scene because Aelin rips into him and basically they went to the treasure like thing and they got them pieces of armor and everyone's like, um, he doesn't want anybody in here. And she's like, well, he owes us for our mercenary like work that we're about to do. And she's like, so this can be our payment. And then his dad comes up and says the same thing. She's like, dude, you owe me. This is mine. This is now mine. 
that's theirs. And Kale is the one in charge. So like she reiterates what Irene says, which is also another sweet scene because Irene had been told by Kale who the letter was. And when Aelin walks up, she's like swaggering because at that time she's trying to pretend that she's okay to everybody, right? And so she even asks after, she's like, was that swagger enough? Like, is that no, like is that my normal? And they're like, eh, eh. like, whatever. But so she walks up and she's like, oh, hi, Irene Towers. <laughs> like, she immediately recognizes her. And it was so funny because then <sighs> Kale's like, well, actually, her new last name is Westfall. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, you're married? We're married. And, and then Aelin also points out that she's pregnant. She's like, oh, you're expecting one? And Kale's like, how did she fucking know? <laughs> because, Kale, you are not observant. <laughs> 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 I love how Aelin treats Kale's dad, too. She just lets him have it. She's like, oh, she turns to Kale. She's like, I can see why you left. And it's just this dagger to him. He deserves all of this snarkiness, Adam. Yes. Asshole. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then... After they save Aniel, they are heading to Terrace. And right at the end, Hussar's cavalry comes in. Yes. To fight, too. And Hussar and Aelin together are hilarious. I forgot, like, what they... But they are both, like, like sarcastic to each other. And it is so great. It's they're so just great. so comfortable in their power. You know, they're confident and they're just kind of bitchy and they don't really care how they come across. And the combination of them two just coming together, it's so great. I love all of these characters finally just getting page time together and meeting. So much fun. And then to bring us all back down, because I'm going to go back to Adian and what he said to Lysandra, because Lysandra is hurt when she goes out there as Aelin as assassin Aelin, basically, because no power. And she basically, the troops start rallying around her because if she's willing to do it, then why not us? And so she is hurt badly. And Adian feels bad about what he said to her and goes out and tries to save her and ends up saving her. And her words to him are basically like, you know, I've felt like horrible about myself and people have treated me horribly and like, I don't matter. And what you said to me was worse than anybody has ever treated me because you were supposed to be better than them, basically. And so that's how we leave Lysandra and Adian is her just telling him off because he was supposed to be better. He treated her like garbage. Even when Lysandra was a high profile whore, if you want it, like she was still treated like royalty, essentially as that kind yeah. of position and Adian just I mean Arabin her, like, treated trash. her horribly though like yeah he treated he, like he treated her like Arabin treats everybody yeah but even that wasn't as bad as what Adian did to her what Adian did to her was just humiliate her too in front of other people constantly it was just yeah and again it hurts worse when it's somebody that you love and you thought loved you when they humiliate you than it does, mm-hmm. like, some random stranger or yeah. somebody that you expect to act like that. So we need to find something else funny because we can't end on that sad <laughs> note. It's, I mean, oh, what else? Ha- happy the stuff that happened. I mean, Lorcan and Elite basically made up. Like, yes, you can yes. tell okay, it's going to go down. It's going to go down. Let's end on two. that note. <laughs> because they basically said I love you mm-hmm. and have a kiss. Mm-hmm. A kiss. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm and good Lorcan still owes that. her the death of her uncle too. So you know, let's not forget that. Yes, because he said he would do that for free. <laughs> he did. There was just so many big moments. I feel like we we're all over the place, but I mean, there was stuff constantly happening. Mm -hmm. And big progress being made, whether it was Manon being embraced as the queen of all of them, and then Aelin also being queen of the little folk, and of, there was like some weird title too, that she became queen of, like the fairies or something. I don't know what it was, but I was just like, really? (laughs) What a title. Um, Yes. And she's the queen of Terrison, obviously. 
Yes. And we did see Rowan's family are still with Adian. Mm -hmm. The White Thorns are still putting up a fight for Terrison. And then we also saw Gavin, not Gavin. What's the face prince? Gallon. Is it Gallon? Gallon. Yeah. He arrived and he's there to support them along with Ansel and the silent assassins. So we've got, we've got a good crew. How many witch towers are there though? Well, she destroyed one. Right? Oh, we didn't talk about that. Like how these witch towers are powered by these Well, we did in a previous book. Doing the yielding and sacrifice. Yeah, we did. Themselves. We did that in a previous book when Manon found out how they were powered because she was pissed off that the witches basically have to kill themselves to do it. Yeah. And we actually see it happen on page mm-hmm. in this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The yielding. I'm just I'm just ready for this like end battle. Like, you know, something big is coming with like all of our allies and then who are our non-allies. And I'm just wondering, like, is Erewhon going to notice Maeve? And, like, are they going to, like, side fight? Or, like, what's going to happen over there? And then I'm also, like, we've been thrown so many, like, clues about these gods and, like, them being a part of this and, like, maneuvering things where they want them. And we've heard that some gods are from here and some aren't. And so I'm wondering, like, are they against each other? Like, are the gods that are helping our crew, like, Anieth? And Hellas and what's the healer god? Sybil? Yeah, I think it starts with an S for sure. Like, are they against the gods like Deanna and what is it, Mob? Malia? Mala. 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 Yes. Like, are they against those ones because they're from somewhere else? And yeah, Mob is one of the three queens that are... A queen. Yeah. Well, two because Maeve. Yeah infiltrated everyone so i'm i'm very interested to see how this ends um and we only have about 400 pages which is also very interesting to me because like there's a shit ton of stuff that has to go down still and we've only got 400 pages to do it in are you scared for any characters i don't think i'm scared (laughs) for anybody i think everybody's gonna survive (laughs) probably not but I can't, I, at this point, I don't know who's not going to survive. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure somebody's going to die. I think Adian and Lysandra are going to make it. Lorcan and Leave. Rowan and Aelin, I don't know. Because right now it's it's appearing that either Aelin or Dorian have to die. But I don't know that they will. I think we'll, like, make it out. Like, strategy yeah. will, will come in there. Yeah, you also have um, Dorian, Dorian frantically, like... I wonder if to be Rolf to take will place. die and Astrin, because Astrin would like be a, a heart tugger if she died. Which, how cute is it that Manon and Astrin's wyverns are mated to each other? Yes. Like, it's so cute. Like, of course they are. And then, like, I'm trying to think of the like minor characters a little bit, like major but minor. That's totally a word, guys. Look it up. Because I don't think that there's, I don't think that the major ones are going to get killed off. Like, I hope Daro dies. Yeah. Minor characters would be, like, members of the 13, members of the Cadre, members of the Bane. The Crockens. The Southern Continent people. Galinus or whatever her name is. And, yeah, yeah, members of, like, the Extra Cadre, members of the Bane, like Killian. So many people were introduced. Rin and Murtaugh and... I mean, I hope Evangeline doesn't die because that would be really sad. And she's kind of been out of it so far. I really hope Maeve does die. I'm not really scared for it, but like I would be happy if she died. So I mean, who else is on her team that's left? Because Rowan tortured Karen to death. Well, it's all the other Fae that she has blood out. I'm sure she has a few, although she's kind of dwindling her own numbers because she's like, Mixed some of the blood oaths and then also like killed Colin or Connell. She's alienated a lot of the people over there too, like the healers and stuff. Mm-hmm. That, that but were... they're still like they're still blood oath or something because they're still doing what she's telling them to do. Something like she still has power over them. But we do see that the healers also. This is another sweet kind of sad moment. We saw that a lot of the healers got switched out. 
because she didn't want them to heal her all the way. She wanted them to leave her in a tortured state and they were healing her all the way. And so we saw, like, I think it was Fenderus tell Aelin that they did that against her wishes. And she asked him, did they ever come back? And he said, no. And so we see that she was killing the healers that were going against her wishes to torture Aelin even further. This creates so much pressure on Aelin too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just more responsibility and, and like lives it's that she- it's happy that they knew that there was a right and a wrong, and that they felt like it was worth it because it it shows like their integrity, even though something has control over them there. So again, like you said, they she is breeding a dissent in them. And so I'm wondering if they will switch sides too when they see the other healers are there. Yeah. At this point, it's like looking at Aelin's side collectively. You have all of her allies. And then on Maeve's side, you also have Morath, like what is his name? Erewhon. And you have the rest of the Iron Teeth witches with the grandmother. And you have, there's someone else. But But I do also think that there's going to be a switch over there because the the grandmother's a bitch and now it's just her because I think Petra's mom's going to then be like, no, you lost fair and square. You're not the most powerful iron tooth witch. And so I have a feeling that there's going to be a, a coup of the witches too, because again, they're then also seeing that they're basically being slaughtered for this. And I think that there's going to be some of them switch sides. Yes, and I still want to see our little revenge scene with Manon getting some payback on her grandmother, you know, not just letting her run away and hide. One of the scenes that was really cool was the Kraken witches when the flame of war is lit and it keeps getting passed on. That little messenger witch hops on her broomstick and goes off. And then you have the scene where all of the witches all across are like digging broomsticks out from under the bed in their closet. Their husbands and stuff are like, what? Witches are real? And them just leaving their families to, you know, answer the call of war. If so, mm, I got chills, like, reading all of that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I like that scene, too. But I was more worried about the children. Like, are they also witches? Like, <laughs> what is their, like, tie to this? Like, Because they don't know. They haven't, like, been brought up in it. Did any of those little children, like, exhibit anything? And, like, what the fuck? (laughs) Mommy. Mommy just hopped on a broomstick. Why am I doing this? (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, about themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, and they were afraid to say anything (laughs) because they're like, I don't know what's going on with me. Kind of like Dorian, like, when he first exhibited his powers. Like, he was like, nobody told me about this. I wonder if any of the little witch children did it. Yeah, I guess it might depend on like their age or something because Dorian was, you know, early 20s or something when it started manifesting or Well, yeah, but again, we don't know when witch powers manifest because they didn't have any for a while. Mm -hmm. So like when magic came back, did any of these little witches like that had been born from the other witches and like not known their ancestry? Like how do you know? (laughs) That's a good question. I that's where my mind went. I couldn't focus on the fact that like this was a like a really good scene because I'm like, wait a minute. If they were having children, like, do we have even more witches? But it's kind of like with the messenger hopping on a broomstick and going around, like she has to know where to go to be communicating this. So it's almost like there's some kind of infrastructure where they still communicate things. Mm-hmm. We're thinking things happen but i don't know all i know is a hell of a lot of things are about to happen in the second part of this book because there are so many open and loose ends yes Uh uh-huh so i am ready to start reading hopefully you guys are but we have only 400 400 pages left one episode left to talk about all of this stuff Crazy 16 episodes talking about Throne of Glass, and here it is coming to an end next week. Fun, fun. I'm still happy that you read this series. I'm glad you liked it. Anyway, come back next week for episode 16, the last episode where we talk about everything that happened in the rest of Kingdom of Ash. 
Bye. <laughs> bye. Thanks for watching, listening, whatever. Okay, bye. <laughs>